Baseline excess is a small effect, 1 to 30% of the input part. It initiates and terminates under the control of the experimental variables, the variables that we have control of, the current density, the temperature, and X, the loading, the D to DD ratio. The effect is rel relatively causal. It's reproducible in a sense. It's predictable. We can determine the conditions under which it will be seen or should be seen or will not be seen. It can be controlled by control over the current <coughs> density and the temperature which control the loading. And we've seen this effect 38 times. Because it's so small, it may be of no more than scientific interest, or it may be that this effect itself might be enhanced. The important feature of the baseline observation is it continues for very long periods of time and apparently only terminates when we choose, either deliberately or, or by experimental clumsiness, to, to terminate the observation. So the power will stay in excess for periods of time. The longest observation is eight days. Heat bursts, these are large effects, greater than 300% of the input power. They appear to initiate spontaneously. Clearly, they don't initiate spontaneously. They themselves must be caused. We don't know what the parameters are that initiate these heat bursts. They are relatively insensitive to current and to current density, unlike the baseline excess. And they even survive small amounts of a nodic charge, that is stripping, reduction of the uh, deuterium to break palladium ratio by electrochemical means, may or may not appear in conjunction with the baseline observation. Fleeting, we have observed this effect only three times. Chaotic, meaning that we don't know what parameters initiate this effect. Because the effect is large, however, it may be useful in terms of a power generating device, which is what my sponsors principally would seek. Peter's idea that at this stage everybody's starting to drift off, so I'll show you a <laughs> picture of what excess power looks like in its, in its manifestation in our experiment. Here we have a ramp of current in a cell of area about 3 square centimeters, so a ramp up to 500 milliamps per square centimeter and then a little beyond. Period of time preceding this where the colorimeter was in thermal power balance, which unfortunately the colorimeter most always is in power balance. We observe an excess, in this case of 1 watt, up to something like 2.5 and 3.5 watts excess, at a time when the input power was 12 watts. So we're looking at an effect of 10 to 30% excess power, where the jaggy line is the raw data and the heavy lines are the data with the compounded measurement uncertainty of the experimental variable variables applied to it. So we know the excess power to be this number, plus or minus this uh, bound. And if we look at the integral of that observation to measure the excess energy during that period of time, we learn the time scale of 150 hours or so, fairly uh, prolonged observation, we see an energy again with its assigned uncertainty. And here, a, re a representation of that as a fraction of the input power. So, a number getting up to 10% of the energy applied to the system at, at that time as a consequence of the excess power that we observe. So, we have an excess of half a megajoule with an assigned uncertainty, which is 8.5% plus or minus its assigned uncertainty of the input energy. This is what the effects that I'm going to describe look like. The baseline observations themselves appear with a reproducible pattern, and they are observed if a minimum of three criteria are met. The deuterium palladium ratio must, ach must achieve a critical value, a value something like 0.9 d to pd. Above that, there is a parabolic or possibly exponential increase, and I'll show you some plots of that functionality uh, later, with increase in loading, possibly asymptotically uh, uh, reaching an asymptotic limit 
at a value of loading of 1, possibly. Not only must we achieve this loading, and this overloading is relatively easily achieved and relatively quickly achieved, it must be maintained for a critical period. That period is about 300 hours for a 3 millimeter diameter rod. It's less for foil. But the important feature here is that that critical period is longer than the diffusional time constant of hydrogen and its isotopes in palladium. It's of the order of the diffusional time constant of other light elements, such as lithium, in the, in the palladium, but it's not a feature of the diffusion of hydrogen in the lattice. So they, you must attain the loading, you must maintain the loading, and you also must have a certain current density and the critical value in our experiments is about 200 milliamps per square centimeter. So you can turn the effect on and off by going above and below this current to the threshold. This is not a very well defined uh, threshold. It tends to reduce in value with increasing uh, exposure of a particular electrode. It is not my purpose to talk about our nuclear measurements. We did monitor online neutron gamma rays did some experiments looking for x-rays, things that are relatively easy to do and not looking at low-level detection. All we can say is that these species, these uh, nuclear products, energetic nuclear products, are not present, quantitatively correlated with the excess power. We also radiograph our electrodes after exposure to look for any evidence of low-energy ionizing radiation. In one experiment, we did have some possible evidence, some exposure of talk about that any further. We've done probably 500 determinations of tritium in our experiments. In no instance have we ever seen tritium enhancement. The, look, the search for, uh, for helium as a possible product or isotopic shifts, all I can say is that we have searched for these and in none of the experiments have we seen strong evidence of isotopic shifts or helium production, and in none of the experiments that we have performed have we produced enough energy in the volume and mass of materials that are present, present that we would expect to have been able to have, uh, observe these as products of nuclear reactions. This is a controversial subject. Controversial its controversy varies from place to place. The reason for this controversy, it seems to me, is that we're dealing with two belief systems. We have a belief system based upon hope. People hope that cold fusion is a reality, is an answer to the world's energy needs. It's a perfectly legitimate belief and a reasonable hope. There's a belief system based upon experience, the experience obtained of neutral nuclear process. Uh, processes in plasmas. Nothing that I want to say today addresses this argument between two belief systems. I only hope to present experimental evidence, facts that we can handle and deal with. I don't believe the controversy will ever be resolved as long as we uh, continue this debate above the line in terms of two different belief systems. One must do experiments, one must determine results with facts and debate the facts. Facts, unfortunately, are known, as always, with certain associated errors, certain uncertainties. And I'll go through a little bit uh, our uh, error analyses, just so that you can get the feel that we understand what we're doing and are handling the errors in a reasonable way. But I'm most interested in presenting the results and not in presenting an error analysis. The sources of uncertainties in these experiments can be loosely categorized into three groups. There's a measurement uncertainty, the uncertainty of each individual measurement in terms of it, the calibration accuracy. One of the things that's difficult about these experiments is that we're doing single sample experiments. In the presence of excess power, we make a measurement, the experiment moved on, we make another experiment, each measurement is a single sample. We cannot repeatedly measure the same observation in order to get a statistical uh, understanding of the uncertainties of that measurement. 